Welcome to the High Tech Freedom Podcast. This is a podcast where we bring successful tech sales professionals, thought leaders, and entrepreneurs to share best practices, insights, and lessons learned with other tech sales professionals. As a sales professional, the more we learn, the more we earn. Once we earn it, how can we put those hard earned commission dollars back to work to build additional income streams that will create the freedom we are all working to achieve? I'm your host, Chris Freeman. I'm a high tech sales leader, real estate investor, and lifetime learner. Welcome back, high tech freedom listeners. Thank you for those of you that have posted a review to the podcast. I really appreciate it. And one quick example is a listener with the name AMQ. You shared a very nice and thoughtful review, and I really thank you for it. I sincerely appreciate it. A five-star rating and a positive review really helps me get the podcast out to a broader audience. So if you have a minute, um, please leave a review. So what's new? So we are working on recording our next batch of guest episodes, and I'm always looking for great guests and suggestions for specific topics. If you know someone that should be on the show, maybe you, please reach out. So let's get on to today's topic. Today, I want to talk to you about tips to writing the perfect follow-up email. I recently came across a blog from a vendor that sells analytics software for sales organizations. It was an article that was in support of a study they did about a year ago, and the title definitely grabbed my attention. So their marketing team, obviously doing a great job. The title was Tips to Writing the Perfect Follow-Up Email. So I love a structured process. So when I saw that title, I stopped to review the article. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever sent what you felt was a flawless prospecting email? Well researched with clear next steps. Have you ever found yourself then frustrated that you have not seen a reply? Yeah, I mean, who hasn't? Uh, and then have you ever followed up with a second email asking if they received the first one? Probably. I know I have. And guess what? I, I don't recall that email working either. So, what was interesting is this study included hundreds of thousands of follow up emails and that study generated some really interesting data. So I just wanted to highlight a few things for you. Number one, shorter emails are not always better when prospecting, but more concise emails did improve results. Concise is about the length and the meaning. So is the message valuable while still being compact and clear? So you can have an email that runs over 150 words or more that contains information and as long as that information is succinct and well-crafted, um, that's good. That can improve your response rate. Longer emails, when packed with value, get results. But what's key to that is you have to make sure that you're including information that connects the prospect or the company to your offer or something that really uh, is impactful to their business. Number two, the study talks about the ineffectiveness of bubble-up emails. Now, I never heard this term before, so I'll define it for you. A bubble-up email is a short, general follow-up email. They point to the previous email that you sent in hopes of putting in minimal effort on the sales rep's part, but still trying to get that meeting. So a study, <laughs> this is interesting, a study showed that these emails were 15 times less likely to help book a meeting. Um, I don't know, maybe it's because you haven't earned the right to ask for the meeting yet. Uh, one of the flaws of the bubble up email is that you, know, you were assuming that the contact saw your first email. Now, with this second short, minimal effort email, you're asking that prospect to search their inbox for the previous email in an inbox that's probably jammed up with a bunch of other vendor emails. Guess what? They're not going to do it. In fact, you may have annoyed them, which is never a good thing when trying to get hold of a customer. This type of uh, follow-up email is just too easy to ignore for the prospect. Number three, avoiding phrases that turn off your prospect. Uh, you, you might get a kick out of this. I know uh, you might be using some of these today. So the first one was thoughts. Have you ever had an email 
where in the email or maybe in the subject line, you had the word thoughts. Maybe you closed out the email with the word thoughts. It's just a sneaky way of asking for a reply. And customers know what you're doing when you do this. Uh, The next one was, I never heard back. When prospects see this, you're either making them feel guilty or confirming their decision to not reply in the first place. Um, Another one was following up. We've all used this one in our emails. It's another way of saying, I haven't heard from you, Mr. Prospect. Instead of saying, following up from my previous note, try something that creates more credibility, like some research on their company or industry trends that they might not know. Remember, that information in the subject line is incredibly important. And that information in that first line of the email shows up in their email preview within their email system. So you really need to make that first line count. Another one was hope all is well. And this one was interesting because the author felt that this term is a just a waste of space. You know, just tell them why you're reaching out. But the study showed that it did increase response rates by 24%. Now to make this more effective, you could add some context to the hope all is well comment. For example, you might say, I hope all is well since, and then insert some personalized reference that ties back to their business. You could say, I hope all is well since the recent merger with the Acme company. So why does that extra context matter? Now, as I personally have really um, been studying and digging into different sales and marketing practices for my uh, real estate investing business, I was blown away with how many automated email and marketing tools are in use today. And this this is really not helping us as high-tech sales professionals because our customers are getting even more bombarded with automated emails and automated text messages. This level of context or this level of personalization in your outbound email, especially in that first line uh, or in the subject line, will set it apart. My example of, I hope all is well since the merger with Acme Corporation cannot be automated or done at scale. And that should help you uh, with your response rates. Um, A couple more here. Uh, The next one was just called. (laughs) And I, man, I am guilty of this one. This is the email that you send after you made the prospecting call where you left a voicemail. Or maybe you didn't leave a voicemail, but you did call. Interestingly, This email phrase had no positive or negative impact on response rates. Now, as an alternative to messaging on what you have done, for example, I just called you, Mr. Prospect, try shifting the focus on what value they will get from taking a meeting, right? Try to make that follow up more about the prospect. Um, All right. And the final data point that I'll cover that I found interesting was that the response rate percentages diminishes with each follow up. Now, that doesn't mean that you should stop trying. Response rates did not go to zero, but a lower percentage of response rate as you go along just means you have to get more creative as you go along. More importantly, you really need to make that first outreach count, right? Do your research, do your homework, and create that first email with your best messaging and your best creativity. All right. So now you might be saying to yourself, hey, great, Chris, you told me about all the ways not to do it. (laughs) What about the optimum way for prospecting emails? Now, this is, you know, there's no perfect answer. I'm sorry to say this is what you get paid to do. This is where a little bit of creativity and art comes into what we all have to do as sales professionals. But I will share a few comments on a rough framework that I've seen work, but ultimately the words the details, the creativity that you have to put into it, it's just going to differ between contacts. So let's start with the subject line. For a subject line, try something with a question. I like subject lines that um, have a question and then align to some pain avoidance versus something that the customer or prospect will gain. There are plenty of studies that explain how people take more action to avoid pain than they do to gain something. For example, and this is not perfect, but a a subject line could be application outage impacting SLAs, question mark. Again, 
you need to take some time with your offering to understand the negative impacts customers experience when they take no action or do not work with you. Okay, so after the subject line, next is your, how do you open up the message? Remember, this is that first sentence that most likely will be seen in the preview of their inbox. And that question around some pain or challenge should be your opening sentence. After that, then state what could be possible. For example, imagine being able to reduce XYZ thing from happening to improve your SLA times to your business stakeholders. Right, something to kind of open up their mind a little bit before you're jumping right into what you can do for them. Uh, all right, now a little bit further into the body, then pick a very specific message that you want to deliver. Base it on your research, what you see in the industry and in the market, and an example of how you can help. As you can see, this takes time, right? This is not your standard email template where you put in all the product benefits in a bullet point format, and then just send it out to your customer. Then close it out, right? Close out the email with a call to action. Now, instead of directly asking for the meeting, try asking for confirmation that it would make sense to discuss this topic further. Now, I mean, this is sort of a fine point. The outcome goal is still the same. You want to get a meeting, but this slight tweak ties it back to what the customer needs versus what you need, right? If you're just saying, hey, I want to schedule a meeting with you, that's what you want, versus asking the customer to make a decision to confirm that this idea or this topic makes sense to discuss further. Okay, this is just a high-level example of a framework. Uh, It's also a lot more difficult to hear the framework versus seeing it. So, you know, please reach out to me if you would like a written example, and uh, I'll send it over to you. Um, Okay, that's it for today. Keep on learning, keep on earning, and make sure to put those hard-earned commission dollars back to work to help create that financial freedom that we are all looking to achieve. Until next week, make this your best week ever. Thanks again for joining us today. To get more sales and real estate tips, you can subscribe to our newsletter at hightechfreedom.com. You can also join our private Facebook and LinkedIn group that is exclusively for sales professionals. If you found a nugget of good information in the podcast, please subscribe, give us a positive rating and write a review. If there is a topic that you would like us to cover in the future, please send us a note through our website at hightechfreedom.com. Until next week, make this your best week ever.